Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Hi, this is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. We took a short break from the coronavirus pandemic and its impact on the national parks this past week, albeit a brief one. Kim O'Connell pulled the curtain back a little bit on restoration work on the Flamingo Visitor Center at Everglades National Park. And Traveler broke the story that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which had ruled in early March that Burnett Oil Company was adversely impacting the landscape of Big Cypress National Preserve with its oil exploration efforts, had decided that the impacts weren't so great after all. We also brought you a story of scientists disagreeing about the impact that bison were having on the northern range of Yellowstone National Park. You can find those and other stories about national parks and protected areas at nationalparkstraveler.org. In this week's show, Lynn Riddick sits down with Doug Lean, the force behind Ranger Doug Enterprises, to discuss his decades-long search for original Works Progress Administration posters that depicted national parks across the West. And we leave you with some thoughts on what we all should be thinking about for National Park Week. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, Foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the national park system for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It's an environmental learning center, a training center, a conference center, and a leadership center all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. Bold and bright colors, big, easy to read lettering, a simple graphic focal point of a prominent landmark. Such is the look of 14 different silkscreen National Park posters created between 1938 and 1941. Part of a larger artist program under the Works Progress Administration, these silk screens were specifically designed to promote ranger talks, hikes, and lodging in the national parks. Underappreciated, lost, destroyed, and largely forgotten during the post-war years, the original posters have turned up in unlikely places and have taken on a life of their own. They've awakened interest by other collectors, copycats, and ignited an understanding of their historical significance by the National Park Service. Two of the original 14 posters have never been found. Former park ranger and dentist Doug Lean is a person who revived the passion for this poster collection. Not only has his 50-year quest for these posters sparked poster fever, it has evolved into a business of designing, screen printing, and selling posters that are as authentic to the originals as possible. From his home near Petersburg, Alaska, Lean talks with Lynn Riddick about the history of the posters, his efforts to find the two missing original prints, and his offer of $10,000 to whoever does. Hi, Doug. Thanks so much for joining me today to talk about the historic WPA-era National Park silkscreen posters and your business of selling them. Well, thank you, Lynn, for including me in your podcast. I'm looking forward to telling my story. I have to say that it's a little challenging to be talking about art in an audio podcast, but I think it's probably fair to say that many people have seen these posters, or one or two of them at the very least, and will go, oh yeah, I know those posters. 
Still, would you paint a visual picture of what these posters look like, what the style is all about? And then I'll also say that listeners can go to rangerdoug.com to take a peek. Well, the prints are, uh, the originals were printed on hard board. They were 14 inches wide, 19 inches tall, and had a small quarter inch uh, land area around the, the design. But they were usually done in four, six, or eight colors, or the historic 13 that the National Park Service made. And they're uh, basically a silkscreen process, which is a, a series of stencils and lined up. So they're block solid colors in block form. There's no, uh, you don't mix too much of the inks together. They kind of go down in layers and um, and they're <clears throat> quite beautiful, in my opinion. <laughs> so what do they look like? What is the general uh, visual theme working? What's the style? Well, it was they were done in the 1930s. Uh, and if you roll back to that period of time, there was a lot of uh, graphic art. It was after the Art Deco era. I'm not really an art historian, but it it, it was kind of in a unique period. The, the letters were very blocky. The designs were bold. They typically had a, a, a headline on the top, Ranger Naturalist Service. And then at the bottom, they had the Department of Interior seal. And the uh, Department of Interior mentioned the National Park Service and, and the name of the park. <clears throat> they all kind of follow that theme. And then it was usually an iconic uh, design with the six, four, five, six, eight colors. So there was generally a central image from something very notable in the parks, correct? Yeah, for instance, Grand Teton had had the Grand and Jenny Lake, which, and that was, the Jenny Lake Museum was actually the feature of the first poster. It was kind of an experiment. And it was sent out to the parks and said, hey, we're going to do this set and here's what we did for Grand Teton and would you like one similar and we'll do a lot better job. And, and I think the Teton one, in its own way, was the best of the designs in, in a lot of ways. But anyway, it commemorated the actual building, the Jenny, Meet the Jenny Lake Ranger, meet, meet the Ranger Naturalist at the Jenny Lake Museum is how it's, uh, the text field is. And it's, uh, but the, there, you have to see them. Once you see them, you won't forget them. They're, they all kind of join hands. They're all similar. Uh, they're, they're, they're a set. They were all done by, I believe, one artist, although I think the first and the 13th, the last one, were likely done by another, a different artist. I want to talk a little bit more about the history of the posters, but first I want you to tell me more about the silkscreen process itself, because I think it's pretty fascinating, especially that each poster is done individually, one at a time, so really no two are exactly alike. And I did want to ask you, what's the better word to use, silkscreen or serigraph? The term serigraph was coined by, I believe, Anthony Valonis who was a WPA artist in, uh, I believe he started out in New York City, which started this poster process in the Depression. And uh, he just took a, a German and a Greek word and just kind of made it up, <laughs> Syrah and Graf. And it, this is very well described in Chris Noon, his book on uh, posters of the WPA. It's a beautiful book written in 1987. He was way ahead of his time. They are silk screens. They're, they were in the 30s. Uh, women were still wearing silk uh, nylon. Or silk, uh, we call them nylons today, silk stockings. And that same silk would flat out use, if they flatten it out on a frame, they could lacquer it and prevent ink from pushing through in certain sections. So they could stencil in a, a pattern in the part that wasn't lacquered. And it was all hand done. They, they uh, cut pieces of paper out I imagine and laid them on top and then lacquered over the top maybe they used spray I don't know uh, the original techniques but it was very laborious uh, each screen had to be built and then they had to be lined up in a in a frame system and the first ones weren't they were but they were also very simple they only had two or three or four colors some of them had one and they were only intended to last a week or two they were they were a message to brush your teeth or read a book or wear a hard hat. Um, it was just a way of making a sign. And they got more and more elaborate with this um, and adding more and more layers and and uh, it became an art form. But Anthony Valonis was sitting in a room with the WPA artists in New York and 
and uh, in those days, they the they would have 30 artists in a room and they'd have one poster on a wall that somebody had made up and they said, okay, everybody copy this. And they, and they made 30 copies and that was their copy machine of the day. It was just literally filling artists full in a room and they all copied the same design. And Anthony Valona said, well, there's got to be a better way. And he built a better mousetrap and it looked kind of like a big mousetrap. Actually, it was a, a hinge system that the screens could be attached to and then they would uh, swing down and uh, you could squeegee the ink through with a squeegee and, and they would flip back up and he could move the next paper in and the old one into a drying rack. And so Valonis came up with a scheme that he could make literally hundreds of these things in a very short period of time. It was still quite laborious. The weak link, the Achilles tendon of this thing was the silk. It, it, just like a silk stocking, they would tend to run. Uh, it's a, a you know natural organic fiber. And the the, when the screens would break down, that was the end of the run. So you didn't always get what you wanted. You might might be able to get 50 to 100 prints before these screens just uh, couldn't print anymore. So they were, in a lot of ways, they're very rare, these prints. Uh, they, they only, in the Park Service made, in, in their edition that they made, the 13 prints, they only made 100 each. So it's, uh, there was actually 14, a 14th one turned up later, but there were 1,400 prints, let's say, made. Today, only 42 of I've found. That's how that's how the difficult they are to find. Talk a little bit about how the National Park Service started making posters and why. Well, the the uh, in the depression, of course, uh, started in New York City. Mayor LaGuardia, uh, the airport named after him, and he started this whole thing making posters because people were staying home and drinking too much, and he wanted them to get out and go fishing. And uh, they were they were gambling, and uh, <laughs> uh, it was t- typical <laughs> depression era uh, stay at home kind of stuff, similar to perhaps today a little bit with this COVID thing. Um, so he got these artists together, and he started making prints. And it, he had one called Fish Tuesday uh, was one of his themes, and he he would put these posters all around New York City and encourage people to go down the Hudson River, I guess, and fish. And this caught on. It went all over the country, and eventually it ended up in Berkeley, California in 1938. A fellow named Dory Yeager was the assistant uh, chief of the uh, Western Museum Laboratories at the National Park Service. It was an arm of the National Park Service. They had a Western division and an Eastern division in in uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, they built all the displays and the uh, interpretive materials for the National Park Service. And back then, the National Park Service, the ranger was a ranger naturalist. They didn't have the divisions they do today. So every ranger was kind of a naturalist and interpreted that park. So they built these posters. Dory Yeager started this project by build, by making the one Grand Teton print. And um, he sent a letter to Boss Pinkley. Uh, Frank Pinkley was his name. They call him Boss Pinkley. And he was the head of Southwest Monuments lived in Coolidge, Arizona at the time. And uh, he was in charge of the big Southwest iconic parks and said, hey, let's uh, make some more posters like this. And he sent a letter out and he said, make sure you order a lot of them because once we destroy the screens, you'll never, you can't reprint these. That's another reason why they're so rare and invaluable. So Boss Pinkley ordered a Grand Canyon print and uh, and others, Zion and uh, Grand Canyon in particular. and. Uh, so that's sort of how this came about. They printed a hundred and they were sent to the parks and they were distributed to the towns surrounding the parks in to the chambers of commerce. We found some of the superintendent's notes in Bandelier National Monument that talked about the actual use of these posters. And they were literally put up around the surrounding towns to get people to visit their parks during the depression. How did you find out exactly how many were commissioned? And how many were produced? Where was that information kept? You know, it, it, it kind of, I approached it from two angles. One in Kristen Noon's book, his math is, is quite alarming even. He said there were 2 million posters made, and today only 2,000 have been found. And there were 35,000 different poster designs. So that works out to about 57, I think, uh, if you do the math about 50 copies and it was really the, the vulnerability of this of the silk screening uh, that would fail and the, the, and these that's that's all they could make and then 
in the National Park Archives, I rooted through a lot of the old paperwork and and parks did order often a hundred prints, and that's all they could probably coax out of these silk screens at the time. Now today we use uh, nylon screens, and we can do thousands, so it's a whole different ball game. But they're still the same quality; it's still that that look. So when you talk about the Western Museum Labs, the place where these posters were made, any idea of how many people were working there to produce all these posters? First of all, the the National Park had their own staff there, and then they they used WPA artists that they uh, they hired. In the case of these prints, uh, it was a fellow named C. Don Powell. Chester was his nickname, Chester Don Powell. And then they hired uh, the CCC, which is not part of the WPA. It was kind of parallel with it. And it was the worker bees of of in the WPA era. And Franklin Roosevelt wanted a core of young men. They trained men between 18 and and 23 to come in and learn a trade and it was, whether it's plumbing or digging ditches or making trails for within the parks they, they worked in state and federal uh, jurisdictions but that i think they had at the western museum labs they had about 150 roughly uh, ccc boys they call them and uh, they got paid a dollar a day the wpa artists got paid 70 cents an hour and they the CCC had to send twenty five dollars home uh, every month. They could only keep five dollars to live on. Is there any way of knowing? I mean, I know there aren't that many originals left, but is there any way to tell the difference between the very first sort of prototype poster made versus the rest of the run? Did they sign them or number them or anything? No, they. In fact, they were forbidden from signing the prints. They're there are there's only one uh, exception to that rule, and that's Alexander Ducks. And we print that poster. It's a Carlsbad Caverns, the great room, the grand room, I think they call it. And it, it, and he was allowed to sign in the screen his name, D U X. So and we print that signature in as well. But the WP artists were government employees, and they could not sign their works. But when Anthony Valonis left the room when they made the Yellowstone prints. Somebody named E.M. Uh, scratched his name in the Department of Interior seal at the bottom, just kind of hidden because they couldn't, the WPA artists couldn't actually use the seal because it's a federal seal. And I don't know the rules in those days, but you cannot use it today. And many people, by the way, are using it on these contemporary prints illegally. <laughs> and I've talked to the, I've talked to the, the uh, people in Washington about this <laughs> So it's an ongoing issue. But anyway, EM's initials found their way onto the Yellowstone design. And if you look carefully at the uh, Lassen volcanic design, the original, the name DM is is etched into the same seal. And I think that is Dale Miller. We don't know for sure, but it's a good guess because they got a photograph of him standing at the press there. So <laughs> he's guilty as charged. But anyway, that, that was the only that was the only recognition that was put in these prints and they were not numbered and these small ones, like I said, disappeared. I think when they figured out how to do this after the first few prints, they just went ahead and jumped in with both feet and just came out with a hundred prints and packaged them up and off they went to the parks. That was the end of them. Now you were a park ranger at Grand Teton National Park in the seventies when you stumbled on your first original poster. And then that began a decades long treasure hunt for the other original posters. Can you tell me a little bit about how that all came to be? Well, yeah, I was, uh, I think it was my first or second year there, 1970 or 71. And my immediate supervisor, uh, I would stay on and work nine months in the parks. It was called a subject to furlough appointment. It was more than a seasonal, but less than a permanent. And then they had to furlough me for three months. So I wouldn't compete with, with permanent rangers. And otherwise I would, my choice would have to be to join the park service full-time and become a full-time employee ranger. So in the fall, we, Grand Teton is unique and we had an elk reduction program. They actually have hunters come in and cull out the herd 
for various reasons, and uh, which is also an <laughs> ongoing <laughs> controversy today. But I would work that elk reduction program, and I'd stake the roads. And we'd have one fall cleanup day usually, and we'd all put on our old clothes, and we'd go in and, and clean out some dusty old barn or whatever. And Grand Teton used to have their own horse corrals. And so we went into the old horse corrals up at Beaver Creek and, and our job was to clean these out. And so we got a pickup truck full of stuff and, and this print was hanging in the, in this dark barn and up on a post. And um, it was but, actually hanging in the, the, the facility hanging well, up like you would hang a normal poster. Well, yeah, well, there, this was a, these, these, these barns were uh, built by the CCC as most of the structures were there at Beaver Creek, beautiful, huge log work. And this was, I think, I don't remember, it did not have a nail hole through it, but it was kind of just stuck up. Uh, I could just reach it and I pulled it down. It was all full of dust and blew it off and took my shirt sleeve and wiped it clean, you know. And uh, I, I looked at this thing and I went over to my boss, Dunbar was his name. And I said, hey, Dunbar, can I have this print? It's, it says, meet the ranger. I said, at Jenny Lake. I, that's where I worked at Jenny Lake Museum. And he said, yeah. And I just threw it in the front seat of the truck and we finished our dump run and cleaned up. And so this poster went in my cabin. Just, it was cool. You know, this was 50 years ago now. <laughs> Have you ever seen one of these WPA posters before? No. And nobody else had it. And I went to the park with it and said, hey, what's the deal here? And and uh, oh, they said, oh, they're all government posters. And they shrugged their shoulders. And But, the, you know, the park in those days, in 50 years ago, they threw out a lot of stuff. The park, I think, is changed a lot of their attitudes towards um, historic preservation and, and, you know, what is our history and how important is it? And these posters, again, they were just hung up and torn down a very, very small part of, 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 of our park history. But it's amazing how people forget. We have to constantly educate over and over each generation. It's just like an echo. You know, we have to, we can't let our guard down. And with the with the prints, you know, I, once I realized that they were government prints, and and I found the photographs and the that tied this all together, you know, I said this is going to be a life mission for me. I'm going to find these things. They're out there somewhere, and I started looking. What are some of the most unusual places where you found some of these posters? Well, the the, <laughs> the interesting thing is, uh, and I'll give a little secret away here. They find me on the internet. I bet they do. <laughs> and yeah, and in fact, uh, I have one fellow that kind of impersonates me, and he he got a phone call one day from the artist's son, and said, "How come your posters are different colors than than the ones th- that I have here?" He could recognize his father's work, and they were recolored. And the reason I printed posters with different colors is because I was working for black and white photos. I did not know. The colors, that was a piece of missing information. So we just made up colors to Yellowstone and, and whatnot. So this fellow gets a call from from the artist's son, and the, this guy is in his 70s, got on the internet for the first time in his life and searched, and he got this other person that passed, basically passes himself off as the one that's trying to find these prints and he's, wants to give the artist the due he's deserved and, and this and that and this and that. So this guy ended up getting these two prints shipped to him. The, this this uh, artist's son had two originals that his father had given him part of his estate. And so this fellow took these two prints and they disappeared for 19 years. And I later got wind of this and all of this information is on the website, so I won't repeat it. And it's too cumbersome anyway, but it took me 19 years to get these back into the public domain. I get I got the Park Service director involved. I got GSA involved. The FBI stepped in. And uh, then I got, went to the courts. And I finally got the two prints back. He claimed that they were given back to the Park Service. They never were. And uh, one day they just showed up. <laughs> so uh, that was one of the more interesting ones that found five in a, in a garage in uh, in uh, Southern California. Most of them are in California still, I believe. Um, there were nine that were found in a junk store in LA, Los Angeles. And uh, I got an email. I was in Antarctica working as a dentist down there and I couldn't leave. <laughs> uh, 
And this guy said, hey, I have found two unique prints in a junk store here in L.A. And what do you know about them? And I said, I know all there is to know about them. And uh, where did you find these? And I said, go back to the junk store you bought these and ask where they came from. How did they get them? Let's trace this story back. I said, I really need to find out more. And, you know, this is the first time, this is the first discovery after the Grand Teton print and a few in the park's own archives. So this guy went back to the junk store and uh, he, he emails me a week later and he goes, guess what? I got seven more and I paid seven, $70 for them. <laughs> I wrote him back and I said, well, you have made what is called a good deal <laughs> because uh, they're worth a great deal more than that. And I said, I don't know what they're worth, but uh, please, please, please keep them together. He wanted to sell them. And what are they worth, you know? And I said, let me look at them first. And then let's try to get all of these put into, I'll, I'll, let me find a buyer in the parks system. I know a lot of people there. And I could never interest the park in doing this. And he, the other downside was he wanted $65,000 for these, for the set of nine. And it was just beyond anybody's budget. And I went to the parks and I said, look, I will match, I'll match you equally if, if you'll buy these. I'll put up $30,000 and uh, I couldn't get any takers. So about two years went by and about a year and a half actually. And I got a call from uh, Nick Lowry at the Swan Auction Gallery in New York City. And he's the biggest uh, auction house for this type of poster art. And he started asking me questions and my heart just sank. And I thought, oh my God, this guy's putting him up at auction. So I had a nice long chat with him. I begged him to, can you just give me one more month? You know, and I, so anyway, I ended up buying a, of the nine, uh, four of these went to the, uh, uh, excuse me, five of them were purchased And this whole auction took two minutes, just boom, 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 like that. And five of them went just so fast. I couldn't even make a bid. <laughs> and then I got to buyers. Yeah, they went to buyers. Uh, it turns out it was the library of Congress bidding. Oh. But I didn't know that. And so I was bidding against the Library of Congress and they have their own bidding agents and it's all clandestine. You, you can't, uh, you, nobody knows who they're buying for and how much they're paying. It's, it's protection for the taxpayer. It's a good system. Mm -hmm. So they bought five and I bought two. And then two went large to uh, out to people. And I don't know who they are, except for the one Yosemite that I now have identified. And uh, th that was a unique one because it was the only known copy ever. The, the, the other one that went at large was Mount Rainier. And we had six copies of that. And so, and I already had one. I actually had three, I found. And so I didn't chase after that one because I knew what it looked like. And we had some very good copies. But the Yosemite was the only one. So I went back to Nick Lowry for years. I just harassed him. <laughs> and begged him. I said, can you please have this person contact me? I realize you have your pledge to keep people anonymous and this and that. And I appreciate that. But this is so unique. I have to know, I have to find out who owns this and talk to him. And so about years went by, I mean, five years. And finally, I got a call just out of the blue. And this guy says, he, he said, I'm the guy that has this poster. And, and uh, so I offered to buy it from him. I offered him $10,000 just because I, it was the only one. And um, he said, no, I'll just donate it. So that's where that stands right now. It has not been donated, but it, I, I really want to, you know, it's, it's uh, got to join its mates in, in the national archives now and, and then it, the public can see it. So anyway, that's kind of this mission. It's sort of <laughs> becoming half paranoia and, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's kind of consume me like Moby Dick, you know, it's, uh, I, I've got still two more to go. And I spent a month in, um, in uh, Great Smoky Mountains in Gatlinburg and, and Sevierville and uh, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, looking in every shop, junk store, chambers of commerce people, old timers, nothing. And then I spent a month in um, Spearfish, South Dakota, talking to the newspapers and they did a beautiful article on this whole mission of mine. And, and again, nothing. And so I'm very fearful that we'll never find these last two, but virtually the, the two largest finds, the one in the one of five and the one of nine were both in California. And that's where they're printed. And that's probably where I'm going to find them. So I'm, 
I'm still looking. I, I last year I met Ryan Zinke before he left the interior. The, he was secretary, and he said, "I'm going to help you find these Doug. <laughs> He's just as passionate as I am, believe it or not." So I'm going to see if we can <laughs> come up with see if we can find these last two. Well, you'll have That's to keep me. us posted on that. Yeah, I will. Once I once I learned about what the scope of this thing and what I was finding, I, I figured, you know, I'm going to make a mission to find the set. I want to rebuild the set and put it back in the public domain where it belongs, even if it's the last one. So I still got 12 of the 14. 11 are now back in the public domain, largely through my donations, and some were squirreled away in parks. Just they didn't know they had them. So uh, found those, and two are still missing, and one – Yosemite, there's only one copy known, and it's in a basement in a large eastern city. I won't <laughs> give it away. And I know where it is, and I've talked to the owner, and he wants to donate it. So that will be the 12th of the 14. And I'm still looking for uh, Great Smoky Mountains. I've never found an original. And I'm looking also for Wind Cave, South Dakota, and uh, we've never found that one either. Do you think there was a certain point in time where suddenly these posters were highly collectible and therefore, you know, the value of them went up and people were very interested in them. Do you, can you pinpoint to a certain point in time when that might've happened? You know, when I first started, uh, when the park said, yeah, these are all government posters and you should write the, the library of Congress. I think I wrote a letter in about 19, oh, I must've been in the eighties before I started any printing. And they said, uh, I think they had three copies, three WPA posters in the their collection at the time. And I think the big difference was in in about ni- in late 80s, mid 80s, uh, Chris Noon, this author of this book, along with Henry Viscara, who's a uh, art design fellow out of LA, and he collaborated on the book. And the two of them and a third person uh, that's into this WPA era of art discovered 1,700 prints made in and they were squirreled away by the artists themselves and they were stored in the the Mer- in University of Maryland up in a turret above the library as i understand the story and this was kind of a rumor the the lost dutchman mine thing you know and they <laughs> finally pried the crate open and they found these 1700 prints and so th- they that's what initiated this book by Krista Noon and that really launched i think a lot of interest in this art Still then, it was kind of known to just a few select artists, and the book was a, a very good success. Uh, it's it's out of print, and I hope to see it reprinted someday. But, you know, it was still kind of a insider information, if you will. And the Library of Congress took, took a lot of the majority of this collection. And I don't know actually where it all went, but I believe it's it's pretty much all what you see on the Library of Congress website today. There were a lot of redundancies in these duplicate copies, but the um, probably the biggest recognition was when I started publishing these in mass and for the parks. We'll talk more about those publishing efforts in my next episode. Lean will walk us through the origins of his business, Ranger Doug Enterprises, the growing popularity of National Parks posters, and how his business is surviving in the midst of the COVID-19 shutdown. For National Parks Traveler, I'm Lynn Riddick. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences that it offers endure for generations to come. You can show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It's also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org.
Dry Tortugas National Park, 70 miles off the Florida Keys, just very well might be the most difficult park to reach in the lower 48. But when you arrive, you're surrounded by crystalline waters for snorkeling, scuba diving, fishing, and kayaking. There are sunken wrecks to explore, coral reefs swarming with colorful marine life, and history in the brick walls of a Civil War era fort. The Yankee Freedom 3, departing from Key West, can get you there in a little more than two hours. Visit them at drytortugas.com. RV Share provides not only an option for renters to enjoy the perks of RV travel without having to buy one, but an opportunity for owners to earn income by renting theirs out. You'll find everything from large and luxurious Class A RVs all the way to small and easy to tow pop-up campers. You can even use their filters to find an RV that is dog-friendly or one that will be delivered right to your campground. Visit RVShare.com to start your search for the perfect RV rental or to list your RV. And now, an editorial. While we're spending National Park Week trying to enjoy the parks virtually, we also need to spend time pondering the condition of the National Park System and asking what needs to be done to show we really believe the parks are America's best idea. Just saying those three words doesn't make it so. If the park system really is our best idea, why have we let half of a historic plantation's slave village within a national park be destroyed? That would be at Virgin Islands National Park. According to a 2011 letter from the park superintendent, the operators of the Keneal Bay Resort inflicted that insulting damage by installing diesel tanks trenching throughout the property that cut through prehistoric ceremonial sites, installing tennis courts, swimming pools, and sidewalks. The superintendent mentioned that, while seeking a legal opinion from the Interior Department's solicitor's office regarding federal jurisdiction and subsequent federal laws, executive orders, and federal mandates as they pertain to preservation and protection of cultural and natural resources. To the best of our knowledge, that opinion was never rendered. And why is the National Park Service silent when energy exploration obviously is impacting the landscape of Big Cypress National Preserve in Florida? You can look at the videos that we've posted on nationalparkstraveler.org or read the Environmental Consultants Report and come to your own conclusion. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers certainly thought Burnett Oil Company was damaging the landscape. Until it didn't. True, oil exploration and development in Big Cypress are allowed under the preserve's enabling legislation. But that legislation also gives the Interior Secretary the authority to develop and publish in the Federal Register such rules and regulations as are deemed necessary and appropriate to limit or control the use of federal lands and waters for oil exploration or development. The Park Service did issue 47 requirements for Burnett Oil to follow as it took its 30-ton vibroses, trucks, and chainsaws to Big Cypress's backcountry. Among those were specific requirements that impacts from those incredibly hefty trucks would be restored to original contour conditions concurrent with daily operations using shovels and rakes. Another requirement stated that field reclamation of impacts would begin immediately as the survey continued. Soils also were to be decompacted, to use the Park Service's word, and returned to match the original grade. Our videos show some pretty compacted soils in one area and rutted areas elsewhere that have not been returned to their pre-survey elevations. Why is that a problem? Compacted soils do not quickly recover and revegetate from damage, and rutted areas can obstruct the movement of water from Lake Okeechobee to Florida Bay that keeps the Everglades alive. That exploration, by the way, occurred in 2017 and 2018, while the videos and latest consultants report date from just this past March. Another issue that deserves serious consideration and addressing is how we visit the parks. Fifty years after National Park Service Director George Herzog Jr. banned traffic from the east end of Yosemite Valley, saying that was the turning point in the people-versus-cars battle, vehicles most certainly have won. 
and not just in Yosemite National Park, despite pledges in 1970 that the Park Service intended to remove personal vehicles from the entire valley. The automobile as a recreational experience is obsolete, Herzog told John McPhee for an article that ran in The New Yorker in 1971. We cannot accommodate automobiles in such numbers and still provide a quality environment for a recreational experience. Banning vehicles won't always protect parks, their natural resources, and the national park experience from visitors. That's most evident at Zion National Park in Utah, where you have to take a shuttle bus into Zion Canyon unless you have a lodge reservation. But even with that shuttle system, there are roughly 30 miles of unofficial social trails in the canyon versus about 13 miles of official park trails. Parks from coast to coast are struggling to accommodate crowds in their vehicles. Some progress is being made in places like Acadia National Park and Muir Woods National Monument. But Arches National Park struggles to find a plan acceptable to the current Interior Secretary, and Glacier National Park is just beginning to go through the steps to decide how best to manage traffic on the the going-to-the-sun road. And when you're thinking about the needs of the national park system, don't forget about those of the national park workforce. Sunsets and sunrises are pretty from a park setting if you live there, but some decent housing goes a long way too. According to the National Park Service, Deferred maintenance for employee housing totaled more than $186 million in fiscal year 2018. Compare that with the $2.2 million the Park Service received that year for its housing improvement program. With such inadequate yearly funding, it's no surprise the problem continues to grow. Repair needs include leaky roofs, outdated plumbing and electrical systems, moldy rodent-infested interiors, and deteriorating historic structures. Not addressing these problems can present serious health and safety threats to staff and their families. The overall maintenance backlog for the park system is crippling too, nearly $12 billion. And just last week, we heard from Yellowstone National Park that they need about $50 million for a new bridge across the Yellowstone River near Tower Junction. Congress can pass a trillion-dollar-plus tax cut, but it can't provide $12 billion to improve roads, structures, sewage plants, and other needs in the national park system, needs that help ensure the safety of park visitors and employees. America's best idea? Surely the tax cut is not our best idea. If we really believe the national parks are America's best idea, we need to act like they are. Politics if it's not possible to totally remove them, must be greatly reduced when it comes to management decisions made by the professional Park Service staff. Those professionals should not have to fear for their jobs if they speak out about damage being inflicted on the parks and move to remove or mitigate that damage. At the same time, Congress must provide sufficient funds to maintain and operate the parks, and it has not been doing that. It's probably not a bad thing that many of the national parks are closed to the public and most of the units are closed to a certain degree. Many of these places are tired and worn from long seasons and so many feet and vehicles. No doubt the elk and bison and deer and wolves and bears and coyotes and raccoons and skunks and other wildlife appreciate the freedom to roam without threat of being run over. If the closures last long enough, perhaps it will convince some of the animals that they really don't need human handouts to get by after all. Enjoy National Park Week virtually if you must, but let's hope we can return to the park soon and we all can begin working to ensure they receive the respect and attention of being America's best idea. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for all your support in recent weeks. Hopefully, the coronavirus pandemic will be a thing of the past in the not-too-distant future. Until then, stay healthy. For National Parks Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's Sounds of Nature, 
These musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.